which is also, and please note, yep, we are being recorded. So please know that we are being recorded. Um, I have the pleasure of being the moderator today for this celebration of Joanne Barker's newest contribution, <laughs> um, Red Scare the State's Indigenous Terrorists. So please, let's give her some props and excitement. Use your emojis and the chat to send Ooh. your congratulations and love to Joanne. Um, we're super excited to all be here today and um, celebrating this, the newest contribution of this fine scholar and colleague and friend. So um, let's see, we will just continue to admit folks. So forgive the distraction. We have to do that by clicking a button. Um, today, yes, we are going to, I wanted to give you an overview hey, of Leo. the program. Uh, so you're supposed to be on with Stephanie, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to first, let's start with some business. Let's um, all mute our audio and mute our video so that when we get to the presentations, um, if you use presentation view or speaker view, then we'll be able to see the, um, the presenters themselves. All right. In the chat, in just a few minutes, we will put in some more um, protocols for participant port protocols for how to manage, you know, the hundreds of us who are here in celebration of this amazing work. I think, yeah, so that just was put into the chat so you can see what that looks like. So today we'll begin with Joanne offering um, some opening remarks and then we'll move to two presentations. One by Audra Simpson and one by Ann Spice. We literally have a man down today. Glenn Colthart was scheduled to speak um, to the book as well, but he had an accident and is recovering from those injuries. And so we just really wanna wish him um, a speedy recovery and we're sending our prayers to him. At the conclusion of Ann and Audra's remarks, Joanne will comment back to uh, their presentation, and then we'll be able to open it up for a discussion. So please use the chat to put your questions. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the time that we have. Stick around until the very end, because again, it's a celebration. And um, we'll be raffling off some signed copies of the book, as well as some fun swag. And that is our plan for today, okay? So once again, in terms of business, please keep your video muted, your video and audio muted, put your questions in the chat. I will be monitoring them as we go. And um, just a reminder that this is recorded. There's more information in the chat if you need it. Okay, now let me introduce everyone. Joanne Barker, our superstar of the day is Lenape, a citizen of the Delaware Indian uh, Tribe of Indians and professor and chair of American Indian Studies in the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University. In addition to Red Scare, she has also published many other things, including Native Acts, Law, Recognition and Cultural Sovereignty, and the edited volume Critically Sovereign, Indigenous Gender and Sexuality, Indigenous Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies, both with, with Duke University Press. And she serves on the Segura Te Land Trust Board. Um, our next presenter will be Audra Simpson. Audra, wave to us all. Audra is Kanawage Mohawk and Professor of Anthropology at Columbia University. She is the author of Mohawk Interruptus, also with Duke University Press and numerous articles and chapters. Her new book is Savage States, Settler Colonial, Settler Governance in an Age of Sorrow. And yep, it's in progress. Hopefully there'll be a party coming for that one soon. And then finally, we have Anne Spice, who is an Inland Tinglet, Tlingit, pronunciation work needs to happen there, sorry. A uh, Tlingit member of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation, Assistant Professor of Geography and Environmental Studies at X University in Toronto, and Associate Fellow at the Yellowhead Institute. 
Her nearly finished dissertation in anthropology at, C at CUNY Graduate Center is titled, Reconciliation is Dead, Indigenous Land Defense in Wet'suwet'en Territory. Welcome to you all. And now I will hand it over to Joanne to say a few words before we move on. Welcome. Thank you so much, Hoku. And thank you to everyone for joining. Um, I know everyone's got Zoom fatigue, so um, I really appreciate you being here. Uh, okay. So I, um, I just have a few, few opening things to say. I live and work in the traditional and unceded territories of the Ohlone people. I value my relationships with them and am deeply grateful for the many ways they have um, supported and strengthened uh, the American Indian Studies Department at San Francisco State. I am also deeply grateful to Audra, Ann, and Hoku, and of course, Glenn in Abstentia uh, for being here today to launch Red Scare. I very much respect their work and am honored that they have been able to make time for mine. Red Scare is part of the American Studies Now series co-edited by Lisa Dugan and Curtis Merez at UC Press. The purpose of the series is to offer analysis of current political issues and debates in a way that is both concise and accessible. It was a particularly unique challenge for me, um, especially uh, being concise. So I appreciate their invitation to contribute and patience with me during um, I think some other roles if folks aren't live tweeting. Go ahead, Joanne, I've got it taken care of. Okay. Um, uh, so yes, so I appreciate their invitation to contribute and patience with me during the revision process. So since I submitted the manuscript last year, I wish I could say that things have changed. Um, Enbridge, a Canada-based oil company seeking to refit and expand the capacity of its line three through Alberta, Minnesota, and Wisconsin has been coordinating with local police, state officials, and feds to constrain and silence indigenous opposition. These efforts have included contracting with two private security firms called Raven Executive and Security Services and Securitas, I'm not quite sure what that means, but to identify and track activists, report intelligence to law enforcement, and even recommend um, legal response. So some of this they learned from the National Sheriff's Association's contracting with private security firm Delve and PR firm Off the Record Strategies in 2016 to not only dig up information on DAPL opponents, but spread misinformation about them to local communities and news outlets, including the distribution of false uh, or fake wanted posters. In its series, Policing the Pipeline, The Intercept reported recently that Enbridge has worked not merely on the arrest, but on the prosecution of indigenous activists and reporters. Prosecutors have, you know, at behest of um, oil companies, been now levying felony theft charges against opponents on top of misdemeanor trespassing charges for interfering with the critical public service facility. So that language, as I discuss in the book, matters in really important ways because it infers and draws from anti-terrorist laws and so allows for much harsher sentencing. Additionally, Enbridge funded state escrow accounts have been set up to allow Enbridge to pay for law enforcement and public safety expenses associated with pipeline opposition. Uh, while unsuccessful, Hubbard County attorney attempted to secure reimbursement from the accounts to cover his own office's um, 
expenses that he said were accrued to process the only over 400 cases that have been brought forward in his jurisdiction. On December 31st, 2019, the British Columbia Supreme Court granted Coastal Gas Link a pretrial injunction against the Wet'suwet'en people from blocking roads and bridges needed to access its pipelines on near their territories. On uh, January 1st, 2020, the council served Coastal Gas Link an eviction notice telling the company that their workers were trespassing on unceded territory. Since then, Coastal Gas Link uh, workers have attempted and have expanded access beyond the boundaries identified on, by the injunction and into the entire region, beyond the road and into trap lines and cultural sites, setting up unapproved staging areas. The RCMP has been conducting raids and mass arrests of those defying the injunction. During one of many bail hearings, Coastal Gas Link attorneys raised questions about the indigeneity of the Wet'suwet'en, um, uh, arguing that, let's see, um, arguing that they're not entirely Indian or the right kind of Indian. So Molly Wickham, um, a leader, learned her identity was being questioned in court while she was sitting in a jail cell. Her attorney informed her that Coastal Gas Link's lawyer brought up the question of her identity the day before arrestees were due to appear at a bail hearing in Prince George. When pressed, um, Coastal, Coastal Gas Link's lawyer said her uh, self-identification would be enough. But the mere fact of raising the question of identity in the first place marks its core use in challenges to indigenous governance and territorial rights. As several prominent identity frauds have been exposed in Canada uh, recently, most notably Michelle Latimer, Carrie Borisaw, and at Queen's University, the political weaponization of accusations of identity fraud by oil and gas companies and legal challenges to indigenous rights render ever present the conflicted and contradictory work of racist ideologies of cultural authenticity and rationalizations of state violence and suppression of indigenous people. In Red Scare, I, I argue that indigenous peoples are identified and made identifiable as terrorists in the service of state imperialism. I try to show US and, Acadian, and Can, Canadian, <laughs> Canadian law defines terrorism as entailing both present and future here and everywhere intended and acted behaviors are seen to threaten the national security and social stability of the state. Both of these threats are linked to all manner of economic infrastructure and growth. So I focus my analysis on two, excuse me, of the many um, types of representations of indigenous terrorism that are out there, um, the murderable Indian and the kinless Indian. The murderable Indian is the Indian who, perceived and represented as a threat to national security, is responded to with the full force of the state's counterterrorist measures, including corporate security contractors, invasive surveillance, detention and interrogation, incarceration, and police violence. Informed by the affectivity of terror, this Indian is seen as requiring proportionately more repressive disciplinary, prison-centric state interventions in order to protect public safety and national security. The Kinless Indian refers to those individuals who claim Indian identity further without any lineal or community-based relationships to indigenous peoples. These individuals and perhaps more so the fraud that they represent are used by the state to challenge indigenous governance and territorial rights. They are represented as terrorists or terrorizing the state um, when they are figured as threatening the social integrity of the state. 
the state's Indian, the Indian who embodies state supported values is embedded in cultural as biological notions of racial authenticity that sustain the legal legitimacy of indigenous rights. And this is an, an argument drawing from my work in Native Acts. The well-entrenched historical grooves of the racisms that inform the Kinless Indian are those into which state discourses and ideologies of terrorism fall easily to justify the use of extreme counter-terrorist measures to protect the state's imperialist interests. The book's conclusion, Radical Alterities from Huckleberry Roots, I suggest that the future is not something we're waiting for, but rather is already embodied in indigenous relationships with one another. These relationships anticipate the abolition of state imperialism and the already real alternative of indigenous governance and relationality to imperialism and neoliberalism. So those are sort of my, my comments and overview of, uh, of the work. Um, again, I'm just so grateful to everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Joanne. This is again, another incredible contribution to you know, indigenous studies writ large and all of the work and yeah, advancing American studies. Um, let's now go to Audra Simpson for her comments. Welcome, Audra. Thanks so much. I'm really delighted to be here. I'm so honored by this invitation, Joanne. Um, my sense is upon my reading of the book that this is the book that we've been waiting for, that you have, um, there are multiple ways that I can frame this. You're making contributions to literatures beyond also Hoku, um, Native American and American studies, but also histories of empire. And if there were to be a study of the sort of microphysics of dispossession, I think we have that here um, in different ways. So I can speak to that shortly, but it is indeed a robust and much needed contribution to American studies. It's a, a robust and much needed uh, contribution to um, a pedagogics of American empire that we've been waiting for. This is not, that tends to these two deep issues that have been um, cutting into indigenous lands, peoples, communities, and possibilities since this mess started. And that is material dispossession, ideological dispossession, and um, this dispossession of relationality and um, personhood in the individual, in individual and collective senses. And I'll speak to that shortly. It gets called identity. And I see Joanne really answering to the call. And there've been so many folks in Native Studies that have, have done this work and she stands, you know, she's on the shoulder She's, she's on the shoulders of some giants in this respect, and she's contributing to this in such a substantive way, but she's really furthering our understanding of identity that is non, um, that works outside of a recognition paradigm. That is, and we've, we've hear it, we hear it in this really thin way, like a bundle of relationships, a, a, a call to something else, but she's, embedding this in, a, in her history of the structuring of people out of their communities, out of their territories by force. She's uh, demonstrating how people are actually in responsible relationships to each other. And she's calling this a native feminist praxis and mode of analysis. And it courses through this book. It's why she's able to achieve this book, uh, this analysis. So it, it is also, I would say, um, an achievement and an instantiation of a native feminist analysis within native studies. And there are like maybe five pieces like that, that we have, right? So she's, she's making these, I think, methodological, theoretical and um, curatorial contributions. And I say curatorial because hist I know what the historians are gonna say. Cause as I was reading the book, I was like, okay, I want it, where's the connection here? But it's there, right? These are histories of 
of yes, imperialism, we might call it settler imperialism. I don't know how comfortable Joanne is with that and she'll speak to it, I'm sure in the Q and A, but these are histories of attempting to move indigenous peoples out of the way out. And she literally uses this language, right? It, she describes the chapters, the murderable Indian and the, the kinless Indian, both she's positioning as they are figure, you know, figures of terrorism to the state, but they're also in different ways. You know, the second iteration is a terrorist to indigenous community, right? And at the end of the day, she's gonna make a call for a, a relationally based model of sovereignty. So, so Joanne, just in, and, and, and friends here and colleagues here, you know, this is the way I see this book moving through our field and moving through our pedagogies and moving through our communities and beyond. Um, I wanna speak to, the ways in which this new American history or this new history of ideas and politics on the United States is doing its work. It's grounded in the empirical cases, as Joanne said, of the figure, I don't want to offend the English lit people, you know, figure. Joanne will sometimes use the language in the book, Barker will use the language of Joanne Barker will use the language of the object the figure, the representation, but that, uh, that in some ways gives a thin account because she's talking about something that isn't fleeting or merely like, you know, a contrivance. These are actual people on front lines and she names them who are obstructing in terms of the murderable Indian. She does a history of this, the figure of fear that they incite in perhaps the settler public. Again, she avoids the language of settler. So I flag that this is my language, but the, the, the figure of the, of the terrorist, the indigenous terrorist is the obstruction to capitalist progress. So, or, or capital accumulation or the production of infrastructure. This is the obstruction. This is what indigeneity becomes. And I think underneath this history that she's given us, there's also that history that Joanne Barker is very aware of, that many of us are very aware of, we're teaching in these materials of the savage, right? So this is the savage, the person who is outside the boundaries of civilization, that is worked upon in particular ways, that is gendered in particular ways. Um, and that becomes in the story that she picks up in the 18th century, you know, the, the terrorizing figure, right? To either to white women or to, um, it, you know, later it will become the, the, the circuits of capital, industrial capital. And as we just heard in that wonderful introduction, um, infrastructure, you know, the infrastructure of, um, of, um, of um, oil. So, and the transport of oil. Um, this is, should be, I mean, we can I even transpose this argument. It's not within the text, but I, you'll see gestures to it to other places in which indigenous peoples in various ways are holding things up and are being criminalized for it. So in this way, I think the study can help us in our understanding of the criminalization of, um, of land protection, of land responsibilities. And I'm thinking here of Mauna Kea, of, um, uh, I think I remember Brendan Hokufitu has a piece on, um, you know, the first person charged with international terrorism was, was a Maori, Maori sovereignist. So, so she's really giving us a nice sort of broader and broader picture of, of the ways in which these logics are moving and seizing people and positioning them in ways that ready them for, um, you know, it's sort of dramatic, but it's also pretty accurate to be murdered and or to be incarcerated. So she's, and there are ways in which she's playing with notions of death there um, that are really interesting. We, we could talk about that. Um, so there's a kind of literal murdering. There's also a, 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 a metaphoric kind of sense, um, but there's also in that a sustained attention by these folks to land, waters, and responsibilities. So, which can get you into deep trouble, right? This, I think, builds, of course, on 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 the works of other people, um, 
on the works. It's, I shouldn't even call it work on the act, you know, the activities, the relationships, the actions. We'll hear this from um, Anne Spice as well of people on the ground in these communities that um, are, are not just reserve based. Joanne also is working with this concept that um, Jessica Catalino and I were just in the weeds a bit with this because we just co-authored a piece and we were working with this notion because other people were working with it. But Joanne, I think is one of the folks in indigenous studies um, who's giving us some, some meat on this is this notion of an otherwise. It sounds really, um, how does it sound? People in the chat can go to work on this. I mean, I, I, you know, we found the article in cultural anthropology. We, we think we sort of know what it is. It's just like, you know, very willful and intentional um, antagonistic or agonistic relationship with the state. And jo but Joanne is showing us, I think, in a really nuanced way, the ways in which Unistotin, we might say even, well, of course, Standing Rock and um, Nick Essie's book is working with the camp, the Ochitsi Sakawan camp there as a sort of model of this other world. We might think even um, back to 1990, um, the so-called standoff in Gunasadage, where you know folks were there for so many days holding ground not letting people through also taking care of each other at the same time um one couple got married there right sandy grande has been working at with folks that um uh worked with folks at, at standing rock at the at the on the occasion of no dapple to help with a, a school form there right so these are sites of of um, generative possibility. Um, and that possibility, Joanne, at the end of the day, I think at the end of the book is saying, you know, these are sort of models for the future, but that doesn't have to mean down the line, it can mean now. So there's so much going on with this book in terms of the, you know, in terms of the broader project, but also in this first, you know, very sort of, I was like, oh no, I don't want to read this. It's going to depress me right now, the murderable Indian. We, you know, we, we, this is a, but it's a, offering this sort of structural and, and I think empirical analysis that's really going to help us. Now, the second chapter of the book is just, um, just, a, it's like, oh, I had this dream, a fantasy that somebody would write this, and then Joanne wrote it. <laughs> I'm, jo I'm making light of it, but it, we need this. Like, we are now, we, uh, all of you, I, I you might be experiencing this. I'm not on Twitter, thankfully. So, like, you know, it's not a total assault constantly. But um, I think it, I think we're on like uh, what is it? Every two weeks now, there's another one. And 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 I want to talk about the difference between Canada and the U.S. And also, I want to say, Joanne, just as offside, you do Canada and the U.S. and you always have really well. And I'm grateful to you for that. You take the time. But she goes through these, you know, the construction of the, not the construction, but the, the legal identity of the Métis, the history of the Métis. You know, the Métis are a people who are rooted in the Red River, and they have got to take these hits, like the Cherokee Nation, all the time, because they are constantly mistaken, as I think Chris Anderson in this book um, called it, uh, a soup kitchen for other in, for for us uh, for like the folks that were pushed out by the Indian like a place a place where people don't know where to go go, and they think they can say they're Métis because you know maybe they have Indigenous blood, um, when in fact the Métis are like a thing. They have their language. They have like a system. They know each other. They have these genealogies, and and they're caught up in this whirlwind of legal decisions that you know at once will recognize them but then we'll open them up further and we've you know we've seen this since the last decision to more claims so this is what your time to move through that material and then ground it empirically in the figure and he is a figure and he is a person and he's a public he was a public figure and he uh wrote many books uh four books and you know she moves through the figure of Joseph Boyden and what he what he represented, which I appreciated. I, I remember I was so
think we're just gonna buffer for a second and then she'll come back. I couldn't tell if it was me or her. I couldn't either at first. <laughs> I think Audrey is, is frozen with the hands up. Did she go away? She'll have to go back, come back in, huh? I think she, yep, had to go and will be coming back in. And she was on a roll. We were learning so much from her and the connections that she saw and made. Oh my goodness. So good. I know she's, she's smart. She's smarter than she's just yeah, average. Than. I know she's so good. Okay. Well then, um, do we feel good about moving on to Anne? And then when Audra gets back, we'll find a way to reconnect. Does that sound good to folks? We've got one th two thumbs up. <laughs> oh, wait. No, no, not. that's not her. I know I'm keeping an eye on that admit button. It's um, her object. <laughs> oh, the joys of, joys uh, of, Zoom. of Zoom. Yeah, this is our Zoom reality. Okay. All right, let's, um, yeah, let's move on to Anne. And, and then we'll, you know, Audra will come back and we'll figure out what to do and we'll just keep rolling with it. Okay, Anne, please join us. Hey, well, thank you uh, so much, Joanne, for the invitation to be here and to comment on um, this wonderful book. And I feel very honored to be in this, this panel and also wanna shout out to uh, Glenn, um, and hope that he's recovering well uh, today. I, I, it's hard to jump into the middle of Audra's like beautiful rant. <laughs> so I'm like, she, I feel like she kind of shorted out like with her hands in the air and I was like, oh no, like I'm frustrated too. Like, what are we frustrated about? Let's go. Uh, I think <laughs> it, she's know. back and it's back, it's wanna... back. can we toss it over again? I feel like I like, I don't want to steal the. Audra, are you ready that to continue? Or are you? <laughs> What's happening? Okay, you need to unmute, my friend. There you know, go. It, isn't, it isn't a Zoom event if there isn't a mini disaster. And <laughs> I, my, my laptop, my creaking laptop ga gasps at the 34% mark. And I didn't even realize we were there. So my apologies to everyone. I just had to go plug myself in in a less ideal spot, but I'm back. And I was in the middle of talking about something. Um, shall I resume with that? Is that okay? Please, okay, so yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark Riskin is reminding me where I was in the, in the talk. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Um, so Joseph Boyden was, um, was and is, you know, cause we're not over this either. These folks, there's something also with the hypermediated space of Twitter and, and Facebook and everything, you know, they're, they're, they're important for like 48 minutes, 48 hours, and then they're gone, right? Well, he's still with us. He was talking to folks about reconciliation. He was, you know, had the ear of Margaret Atwood. He was, you know, meddling in business at UB, using all sorts of things. And Joanne and Barker, Joanne Barker in the book, you know, shows us, demonstrates to us Actually, Joanne doesn't do this as much. And I think this is, it's not a criticism, Joanne, but he was all up in stuff, right? And that's something that uh, you mentioned this, but this is what, how he got onto my radar. Cause I was like, who is this, you know, person talking about reconciliation? Who is this person? I want to know these reconciliation Indians, right? And um, because this is its own thing. Anne will talk about it. It's, it needs to be treated with some degree of skepticism, right? And he was all for it. And he was all over the place talking about this. And so I wanted to know where that was coming from, right? 
If Negan Sinclair talks about this, I know where it's coming from. I can listen to Negan Sinclair. I respect Mary Sinclair. I will listen to those people, right? And so this one, I wanted to know where he was, who he was coming from. And I too noted Nipmunk, uh, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, one minute he was Mi'kmaq. Um, so I was curious about those changing claims. And this is something else I wanna say about identity, so-called identity and these issues and these problems. Joanne, this is where jo Joanne furthers the, the conversation is this notion of the kinless, right? This is a person that is, and jo Bar Joanne Barker uses this language, kinless without accountability or relations. So what are the consequences of that? What are the implications? They do and say as they will. They are the ultimate individual. There's nobody calling them in. They're not accountable. They don't have to think before they speak. They are their own thing. And this is consistent with the mode of identity that has been in play. It has been operating like a claim of property, a claim of exclusion from. And do you know what the exclusion from? It, it, it is not exclusion from white folks or presumably black folks, you know, the red in the middle. It is the exclusion from a community, from a territory. That's how it has been operating. And that's how these 16th century folks, these 17th century folks, the ones that, you know, have no check-in, no accountability, they can say and do whatever they want. And this is how this, and that is not a mode of freedom for indigenous people, right? I, I would say, and this is where we go towards the end of the book where um, Joanne cites this incredible Mura woman who would not, would not t allow herself to be identified in um, a document um, in an international fora. She says something really quite moving, really important, and she will not allow herself to, to be given credit for it because she says it belongs to the Mura people, right? So she's, point, she's pressing upon identification, identity, and, and authorship, um, all of which are tied to notions of property, right? So I think Joanne in this, uh, Joanne Barker in this, account and this analysis of the kinless is far more elegant than I'm describing because, you know, quite frankly, some of these folks just really piss me off and I'm tired of it, right? So it's hard to be elegant about this, but because it is relentless. So this is what I will say is, I will ask is why is this relentless? Why is it relentless now? And, and how do we deal with this in ways, you know, I think this scholarship, it, it helps in a way because it's something along with the, the better journalism that we're starting to see now, it gives us something to point to because indigenous people have been talking about this for years, right? For years, and nothing has been done. I mean, Phil's book, Playing Indian is helpful. We see that this is actually part of American uh, nation, you know, the, the sense of an American self. Um, you know, this is a practice that's been tied to the formation of American anthropology, Playing Indian. Um, but this is, is no longer just play, it's a claim of property that positions people in ways to take up space, to have the ears of powerful people, and actually, you know, to, to assume positions that not only would they not have gotten perhaps otherwise, but also that deny indigenous people's opportunities, right? And, you know, so there's a way in which what I'm saying right now, I know doesn't sit well with some of the analysis of Barker because she, Barker at the end of the day wants to see a different kind of, um, a different kind of world, right? So it's, you know, she's, she's calling for, if you're gonna, if you're gonna talk about rematriating, which she does, which is part of, uh, um, not just attributing kinship, but living kinship with each other and, and being capacious at the same time, there has to be a different sort of socioeconomic system in place. And that's part of the work, right? That's part of these, these, these otherwise communities, which are not really that otherwise. These are Indians being responsible to land water and their relatives, right? And to our friends outside. 
Um, but it's unless you unless you are going to do that, I think we're stuck with these models of the you know the individual claimant who can say and do whatever they want, right? It's it's a kind of mode of settler freedom, right, at the level of the self. So um, so clearly, I can say that I you know I could go on about this because it's just it is every two weeks. It is remarkable. And I just, you know, read this article about the, you know, the graduate student at Penn who may have completely a white woman who may have, you know, this is a different kind of situation, but she may have completely, or maybe not completely, right? We're not privy to the to the the materials, but may have really fudged elements of her life and exaggerated abuse, perhaps definitely perhaps socioeconomic status at one point. And, you know, Penn moved swiftly to do something about this. And not only did Penn move swiftly, they wrote their letter to Rhodes and Rhodes moved swiftly to, you know, for, anyway, this is a, somebody can put it in the, in the chat box. This is in, I think the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Um, but when it comes to indigenous frauds or questionable indigenous folks, or let's put it this way, white people or non-native people who have perhaps been dishonest, acted dishonestly, nothing happens in the States. We're seeing this change definitely in Canada with Carrie Barassa. Um, but um, it, it's, it's not something that I think folks can really get their heads around yet or get their teeth into. And I think Joanne Barker's book will, will really help us along the way. So that's all I have to say for now. And I look forward to talking more further into the book panel. Thank you so much, Audra. We're so glad you were able to get your laptop plugged back in so that you could finish that thought. You left us all hanging. We were all like, is she frozen or are we? But we all must now wait. So thank you so much for being able to come back. All right, with that, we'll take a deep breath and move to Anne. Hey, thank you so much. I'm so glad that I didn't have to substitute for the second half of Audra's fiery <laughs> yeah, sermon on kinship and kinless, kinless Indians. Um, though I share, I share the, the anger and frustration with this. So I'm, I'm definitely very grateful for all of your comments there and um, all of the really detailed ways uh, that uh, Joanne Barker has sort of connected this, this debate as well um, into what's happening on the ground with indigenous land defense movements. So um, the, when, I, when I picked up the book and started to read, um, I, I sort of found myself and I was thinking about how, what, what I was gonna say for this, um, this, this book panel, um, this book launch. And uh, I ended up in a, in a kind of, um, dilemma, which is that I have, I have like too much material <laughs> that, that fits. And I, I read the book and I said, this is like, this feels just like, um, it's just intuitive. It just is the way things are. And, um, I think that is why it's so important. It's because it's giving a uh, voice to, uh, an experience that a, a number of us have had on the front lines of indigenous land defense, um, that at least for, for myself, I was having trouble, um, pulling language in that really spoke to what what it what it was that was actually happening in the relationship between indigenous people and industry and and police and and the, the general public. Um, so the first point I want to make is that, um, that that I really appreciated in in this book is the way in which um, it's not set up simply as a, a disagreement between indigenous people and industry or indigenous people and the state that um, uh, Joanne is uh, careful to remind us again and again that um, the public gets pulled into this and that they do that willingly, um, both to sort of uh, place indigenous people in this category of terrorist, um, to shore up their own self-defense um, against the threat of indigenous sovereignty, essentially, um, and that, that, that movement is also happening uh, as, as the public is getting pulled into this and that, that's, a, that's a willing movement. And that is definitely something that um, I, I've experienced on 
uh, in these spaces, in these movement spaces. Uh, but it's really hard to put your finger on it because people want to, um, I don't want to say write it off, but it's not quite even that as, as a sort of simple racism. As like, there, is, there, are these, there are some people out there that have these racist ideas, but most people don't. Most people are supportive. And at the same time, they're building the wall. And at the same time, they're like creating the, um, the sort of space around them that is pushing indigenous peoples off of the territories. And so um, there is a way in which the public is participating. And I, I really appreciated that getting named um, because I think we have a lot of um, well-intentioned liberal allies who want to say that they're on that side while also continuing to protect themselves against us um, and buying into the same projects. Uh, um, in literal ways sometimes um, that are causing this destruction on indigenous territories. So I really appreciated that, that piece of it. I think this, um, this concept, this uh, like figure, um, as Audra was saying, of the, the murderable Indian, um, as distressing as it is to have it put in those terms, has also really helped me to identify um, something beyond criminalization because criminalization is certainly happening to indigenous people defending our territories. Um, you know, people are arrested and, and put in jail. You know, we see the, the statistics um, in this book as well around uh, indigenous incarceration. Um, that's certainly happening. Um, but there's something else that's happening on the front lines uh, with constant surveillance, with the, the way in which indigenous peoples are figured as a threat um, that is, is beyond criminalization. And it is this feeling, um, a feeling that is, is true and factual that the state has the authorization to kill indigenous people if they are in the way of industry. Um, that authorization is literal. And so in the case of Wasoden territory, where I've done most of my work, that meant that the, when the police raid the territories, they come in with lethal overwatch which means that they are authorized to pull the trigger um, should they feel threatened enough. And everything that they do is about assessing the threat level that they expect to encounter when they arrive on the ground. And so we discovered that that was the language that was, that was being used after um, the first raid, uh, as Joanne mentioned, which was in early 2020, um, or 2019, sorry, um, that, the, the you know, RCMP forces, police forces came in um, uh, with that sort of lethal overwatch in place. The second raid, set of raids um, in 2020, uh, I was arrested on the territory along with a number of others. Um, we saw them. So they, they stopped even sort of like hiding in the bushes at that point. You know, they were right there with a sniper pointed at the tower that, that myself and um, other land defenders were, were staying in. And so at that point, um, you know, they've pushed away the sort of veil of any sort of like liberal PR. They, they don't care about the PR anymore. Um, and when questioned um, by media after the fact as to why they were pointing weapons directly at us, they claimed that they were only looking through the scope, that the weapons were not pointed in our direction. Um, that this was a, a, a safety measure in order to uh, assess the level of threat because they knew that there were hunting rifles present at the encampment. And so th this, I mean, this is like an absurd sort of logical leap to say that, that you, can, you can point a gun at somebody without pointing a gun at somebody. But this is, this is the, the language that they themselves use to leg legitimize the kind of force that they're coming into the territories with. And they did the same thing in this last round of raids, which is uh, was in the fall in November, um, where they continued to come in with this sort of lethal force with dogs, helicopters, snowmobiles, you know, the whole thing. Um, they they got again called out for that level of force. And they said that um, the reason that they had brought that kind of militarized force to the territory is because they had heard talk on Facebook after, you know, their continuous surveillance that um, that people uh, considered their invasion sort of a declaration of war, that we are at war. And so when Indigenous people state what to us feels obvious, that we're under attack, um, that this is a continuation of genocidal policies, that people are being, you know, wiped off the territory, um, 
you know, and that that is, these are actions that are warlike, that is used as further evidence that they need to bring in more force, um, just in case, just in case there's uh, something more than a peaceful resistance that they come up against. Um, so that that sense that, you know, they, they have to keep us in that space of being killable, um, of them having the power to sort of make that decision based on their uh, perception of us as a threat. And I think that Audra is, is definitely right on um, thinking that this is connected to the characterization of indigenous people as savage. Um, you know, these, these things certainly go together. Um, but they, they go together in this, in this sort of strange state logic um, that plays on the kind of threat level they're experiencing. And all you have to do to be considered that kind of threat is to be in the way. You don't have to pick up anything. You don't have to make a statement. You don't have to use your words. You just are in the way. And that is enough to be uh, the murderable Indian in this case. So um, I really see this playing out. And it, it, the, the language in the book and the way that this is built up historically for me is, is um, so helpful for helping to articulate what it is that is not only distressing and um, you know, traumatizing and psych psychologically difficult for people who are taking that position, but also to kind of get at what, what the issue is on the other side of it. Um, because it, it's difficult to explain to people um, after that kind of spectacle in which nobody was hurt, um, you know, uh, people were arrested and then released. The sort of like at the end of the day tally of how we're doing is like not, you know, on paper doesn't look that bad, um, but we're still in that position and we'll be in the position again as soon as we are on the territory in places where um, industry doesn't want us to be. And I think that it, it does another piece of work when it comes to how um, how it works with, uh, with the land itself and the way that that land is coded as uh, being appropriate for industry, but not appropriate for indigenous life. And so um, I, mean, I talk about this in the sense that this is, the spaces are made carceral, um, but it's also kind of a, a remaking, a recreation of terra nullius that, um, you know, when the spaces need to be cleared and they are literally cleared, uh, like clear cut uh, in, in preparation for the, these pipelines being built, that as that is happening, um, there is a simultaneous removal of indigenous people off the territory. And this is how it's accomplished. It's accomplished by making indigenous people a threat, no matter what they're doing, no matter if they're you know, gathering medicines or um, picking berries or hunting or, or whatever, that that, that land needs to be sort of cleared in order to make it a space that can be suitable for construction. Um, so I see this happening and again and again. And one of the, the ways that it's happened most recently um, is in the conditions that have put on uh, uh, the people who were arrested um, in order to secure their release. And so this happened um, to Molly Slato and others who were recently arrested. They attempted to put these conditions on us in 2020, but they didn't stick. Um, but the conditions are that unless you are a Wet'suwet'en person um, and they decide somehow who is Wet'suwet'en and who isn't, that you are not to return to the, that territory, that any of the territory along the logging road that leads out to these encampments is off limits unless you are Wet'suwet'en, which has the effect of um, placing major restrictions on people who are in relation to the Wet'suwet'en but not what sow it in themselves. So people like uh, Molly's husband, Cody, who's Haida, um, he is allowed to go to his cabin, which is along the logging road, but he's not allowed to gather firewood. He's not allowed to hunt. He's not allowed to go off of the, 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 the trail, um, essentially. Um, and this has happened to other people as well. So not only um, decides who and who is not, who, and who, who does and does not belong on Wet'suwet'en territory, it erases the Wet'suwet'en's ability to make relations with their neighbors and with people who are kin um, in order to allow them access to continue to, to live on, the, on that territory itself. Um, so it has, again, the effect of saying, basically, if you are not, we're not already doing something on the territory, there's no reason you should be there. Um, 
if you don't have a cabin there, there's no reason you should be there. And in the meantime, you know, the cabins are being burnt down or destroyed or demolished. Um, so there's a, an erasure of evidence of, of prior use. There's also this legal mechanism where uh, they can only imagine, indigenous people now can only inhabit the specter of the terrorists, that the only reason you're on the territory is to block progression of construction. Nothing else um, can sort of be like, uh, as an, an indigenous person who's not Wet'suwet'en, and nothing else is appropriate um, for, for being on the territory and you would be in breaching, breaching the injunction to be doing anything else on that territory. Um, so there's, I mean, a lot going on with those sort of mechanisms I see working um, uh, legally and uh, as well as the sort of police actions that have been the, this repetition um, of the, you know, building up this, this, this character of um, the murderable Indian. And I think that, that that language really, really helps to sort of um, highlight what it is that's going on in a really, really particular and historically nuanced way. You know, how did we get to this point? Um, and then when we have discussions around recognition and reconciliation, you can see why we take such a hard line. Um, you know, the, the language coming out of, of uh, what's so in territory after the 2020 raids is that reconciliation is dead. Um, people didn't like that. People were like, why are you giving up on reconciliation? Like, well, we're not giving up. <laughs> like, you just can't have this kind of conversation when someone's pointing a gun at you. And so there's, there's, there's a way in which this is just a, a, a read of the, the situation we're in. We're not allowed to be the kinds of citizens that negotiate. The state doesn't negotiate with terrorists. They're not gonna sit down at the table with us um, and talk about the kinds of things that we want to talk about in those spaces. Uh, and there's something that happens to our movements when we're continuously put into this place where we are, um, you know, subject to that kind of state force, um, and that where we we need we uh, invite in ways um, that kind of state force just for existing in these spaces where we're not supposed to exist. Um, so you know that that was part of the reason that 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 feeling of frustration that there's nothing we can do on this territory there's nothing we can say or do um, that gets us out of this subject position we're going to be here either way um, and you start to feel it uh, you know when the police are following you and you're going out to hunt or, or gather berries you start to feel to feel it you know that like there's nothing there's nothing I can do to be like um a good Indian in the situation. <laughs> it's, it's always going to invite this kind of response. Um, and there's nothing uh, sort of like to, to, on our end, to like adjust, in which case we're like, yeah, the reconciliation is dead in that case. Um, and as some people have also pointed out, maybe it wasn't ever alive in the first place. Um, so I think that um, thinking uh, uh, about reconciliation and thinking about how we as, as a movement are also pushing back against these forms of subject making um, and how that works on the territory itself, how it works on, uh, as to like how we move on the land um, and what kinds of uh, sort of self-representation we have access to and what kinds we don't. Um, I think, you know, people have spent a long time attempting to appear peaceful and in the end they bring in the same amount of force. Um, and so there's something about that as well that you know, we only have a certain number of characters we're allowed to play. Um, and, uh, you know, in the end, it sort of doesn't matter what costume you have on, they're going to come in with the, with the full force of the police anyway. Um, and so then you start to think about, you know, why, why are we putting on this show in the first place? What else could we be doing? Um, and I think that is, is what's starting to happen on what's so in territory and other places where, um, you know, the the sort of facade that we can we can pretend that um, the state isn't going to call they aren't going to bring in the troops this time they aren't going to treat us as terrorists um, after you know three three series of police raids um, we know what their response is going to be uh, and no matter what we do on our, our end of things so um, yeah I think that the the uh, I, I, I wanted to see the last chapter of the book kind of continue because it has this, it has this very sort of like hopeful, um, 
you know, building uh, the, you know, the possibility of uh, um, sort of leaning into relation and kinship to build alternatives. And the, 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 the first two chapters, were, which are, you know, really illustrative of what we're going through and at the same time quite distressing because of that. Um, and so I'm excited to see where this goes because I think it lands us in a really um, generative place uh, to think about what are what are the alternatives to this. Um, and now that we have this language to talk about how these these different movements um, come together to kind of produce this this subject position in the service of American imperialism, like how how then do we um, really then flesh out what we mean uh, in terms of the kinship relations that we want to we want to hold up. Um, and I think that that's hopefully kind of where we can go with some of the discussion and what, what will come of this book, which I think is uh, just a really important resource for all of us who are doing, doing this work. It not only gives voice to our experience, but also kind of points a, a way forward. So I want to say thank you to Joanne Barker for writing this and um, I look forward to having more discussion. Thank you, Anne. That was fantastic. Okay, so I, um, before I hand it off to Joanne to respond to both Audra and Anne, I did there, a question really quickly. Will this video recording be available to people who registered? Yes. Okay. Now, I don't, yeah, take it away, Joanne. Um, so is it useful for me to just make some comments or do, do Audra and Anne want to ask specific questions? What is the... What is the feeling here? Yeah, what would you, what would be useful? Is that, are you asking, sorry, got a little dog barking. Is that um, a question posed to the broader um, community or to, to Anne and I? To, to you and Anne specifically. I would just love to hear you talk at this point. Um, I, I had little, like during, what, during I, I asked you little things, you can yeah. respond to them, but I didn't like devise questions for you. Okay. I would just okay. love for you to respond as you, as you, as you would like. Yep. Yeah, same. Same. Okay. So, um, I think that, that, uh, the question of whether or not I'm an historian, I think I was Audra's, <laughs> um, I've, I've heard that a lot. I heard that I've heard that with my writing sort of all along. So I always feel like I should say something um, uh, without laughing about it. But you know, I'm, I'm not an historian, I'm an interdisciplinary person. So I don't start with a canon, and then, you know, write everything in response to that canon. I start with a set of questions. And then draw materials that help me think through those questions. So I would just affirm um, the concerns of historians that feel like I'm not an historian. I think I, that feels right to me, <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, and then the the issue that that Audra was raising, and and I think Anne as well, around you know the sort of the what next or where do we go or what is this otherwise. Um, uh, at the same time that I was finishing the last draft of the book, I was participating in a project at UCSC uh, called Visualizing Abolition. And I strongly recommend everybody go and take a look at the, those conversations. They're, they're really quite amazing from folks doing uh, uh, visual artists, you know, musicians, um, filmmakers, all, all kinds of stuff, uh, activists, um, and, and trying to think about this question of, of abolition and what that means. And in relationship um, uh, to that, or, or in conversation with that, the, the concluding chapter was kind of thinking about the way that those questions matter for Indigenous communities. The, you know, what does it mean for indigenous peoples to talk about abolition? And so um, uh, 
I'm not sure how the what the best entry point is for this, but one of one of the really deep concerns that that gets raised quite a lot is well, what about those who were committing really violent acts against people? Like, what are you going to do about murderers and rapists and child molesters? Like, if we do away with the police, they're just going to have free reign. And I think what happens with that question is that it gets us stuck in the idea that the US and Canada are the only systems of governance, the only set of laws that aren't just on the books, but actually working. And so I, I would argue or, or suggest that indigenous communities already have laws and governance for dealing with those issues. And so it's not about, you know, when we talk about abolition, it's not about creating a void where, where there is no accountability and there is no um, resp the responsibility for, you know, these kinds of, of violences against people. Um, we're talking about uh, a, an affirmation of um, indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. I also don't want to romanticize that. I mean, I spent a whole book talking about the politics of recognition and membership, uh, precisely to think through the troubled ways in which the, the question of sovereignty and self-determination, right, gets played out, not just between indigenous communities and the state, but within indigenous communities and how we treat each other um, well and not well. Uh, so it, it, I know it's not a simple question um, or set of issues, and I just want to push a little harder to get people to talk about, you know, what that means. Um, you know, the, the, the coastal gas link attorneys frequently bring up in their, in their hearings and legal briefs that, that issue that outside of the context of the, um, the Wet'suwet'en, the, that um, all these other First Nation peoples have signed agreements. So what is the problem? Um, so clearly we're in, right, the, the sort of problematic of, of cooperation with and complicity by our governments with, by indigenous governments with um, these, these interests. So it's not so simple as to say, you know, abolish it all and return to to tradition, we, we, we need to get there, but we need to get there really carefully um, and in ways that, that um, affirm other types of possibilities. So um, I always think, you know, the otherwise, I, I, I prefer the term otherwise than to futurism because I, I, I don't think what we're talking about is in the future. I think it's what's happening right now. Um, I think indigenous people are exercising kinship relationships that are differently to the land and to non-human others. And that it's, um, it's about, uh, it, it, so it's not about um, a future, it, you know, that these are relationships that are lived in. We have, indigenous communities have rich, complicated cultural histories um, that, that aren't just put on hold when the state comes in. So, um, but I'm, I'm anxious to get to, um, to, to audience questions and comments um, as well as my own blathering. I can, of course, as most of you know, I could talk for hours. So I don't want to just talk for hours. <laughs> well, we have um, a question, a rather long question from Mark Rif Rifkin in the chat. Um, oh, why don't I read it for us all? And it's a question that is directed to all three of you. Good. So here I go. If, as Anne was noting, there's not a way to occupy political subjectivity in ways not understood as terroristic, and as Audra was noted, there's also a huge problem of people fraudulently claiming indigenous relation and belonging genealogy. How do you all three think about what kind of structure in governance should state, how are you thinking about the internal infrastructures of indigenous governance? Or is the question of indigenous institutional infrastructure the wrong or an unhelpful framing? 
how are you thinking about the relation between relationality and institutionality? We'll just let that one, so all of those amazing questions sort of sink in. And whoever's ready to respond, take a stab at it. Do you mind if I go? Do you yeah, Audrey, don't mind if I go? It. It's okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I think Mark, thanks for this. It's really, um, it's really well organized. Also, um, I think as you know, further to what Joanne was just saying, there there are, um, as we all know, many of us know, right? There are models of governance that are in place, and whether or not they're recognized by the state, they're, they're happening, right? So there are, for example, and we have literature on this, which some of you know, of course, you know, Sue Hill's, Susan Hill's written a fantastic history of uh, member, uh, I'd say governance at, at Grand River, but you know, the ways in which the traditional chief, even when brought in, when the Indian Act was imposed upon that community uh, by bayonet, like they still kept making decisions when in band council formation, to protect the interests of children, right? So there are ways in which even with the, with the colonial chokehold, um, traditional ethics have been, have guided decisions. That's not to say that that should continue, that the structure of band council or IRA governance should continue. And, and that means then, you know, the, the resurgence paradigm, you know, Leanne and Glenn and, and, and Gerald Alfred's formulations on, that I notice they don't use the language of revitalization because you know these systems are not dead, right? They are right. yeah, they are they're they're arguing for a resurgence of them. Um, you know that requires for some work a re a re a re relating to those systems. Um, for some of us, it'll mean hopefully being adopted if we are outside of those systems. Um, but it means you know looking at them and taking them seriously as structures that can help us in this world. And I think that folks have been doing this for the past century, right? Sometimes, you know, the potlatch was outlawed, right? The potlatch is not just a system of exchange. It's a model of governance. It's a, it's a system of, that can, of conduct also and, and, and governing relations, you know, through giving gifts. It's not just giving gifts, it's exchanging, you know, sentiments and, and care for each other, it's seen as something else, I think. But, um, and so for us, for example, it would be our clans. Teresa McCarthy's written a fantastic, you know, um, ethnography on the, on the, on the, the work of reacquiring that knowledge um, and, and, you know, generate, working with um, folks in the community to, to reignite a clan, right? To remake, the, to not remake, because it already exists, but to sort of resurge it. So I think this is happening. Now the question, Mark uses the language of institutions. <sighs> I'm thinking of Weber, which I shouldn't do too much, but um, <laughs> you know, I, and I don't think that's Mark, you know, I, so I think these are institutions that we're talking about, right? They're not bureaucracies, but they are institutions. But if Mark is thinking of, and I'm sure he's gonna tell us in a, sec in a second in the, in the chat, but if Mark is thinking of like institutions of higher ed, Institutions of higher ed have to do something. They have to figure it out, you know? And this is not, this is goes back to what I was saying about this identity business, which becomes self-identification, which becomes, right, you right. know, the, the license, the license to not ill, right? It is a license to, 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 to perhaps perpetuate a fraud. And, and we know empirically that that has happened, that it's happening or it's being reported more, or it's of public concern in some places. So what do institutions do? They need to think beyond identity and they need to understand that indigenous peoples are not racist, that we're not minorities, that we're polities, that we are political orders, albeit in some spots, strangulated, but still breathing, and that we, this is, that's how, who our people are. So if somebody right. checks the box and says, I'm, I'm Miwok, or I'm Mohawk, or I'm Cayuga, no problem. You get in touch with those people, 
and you talk to them and say, is this person a relation? And they don't, not are they recognized, not do they have BQ, not do they, but are they a relation? If they're on a list, that's easy. If they're not on a list, they can still be a relation and they can tell you this, right? I don't, so I, I don't know why, I, I do know why, but um, it is easier, I think, just to see us as minoritized people that um, are fulfill some sort of spot. And, and Joanne uses this language in her book too. She says multicultural. You right. know, this is the kinless. The kinless slips very easily into that. Um, now the kind may be less so, right? Yeah. So, but it's but these are that isn't even a shorthand for what is actually going on in these communities. These Hawaiians have their genealogies that go way back. They're not about the tick. You know, they can tell you their genealogy. That's part of their, their subjectivity. They're like, co they're collectively oriented and they're, right. they can tell. Right. So, so I think this is, so that's complicated in a bureaucratic regime, you know, to like call up so-and-so, oh, can you tell me your genealogy? And it's also just comforting now. Oh, oh, we're not, we don't like to get into the business of identity. Well, they're perpetuating a regime through the self-identification matrix. So they are in the business of identity and they're in the business of diversity and looking good in the thinnest possible sense. So I think market requires a reorientation for these institutions. I think they, they have to recognize, you know, pun intended, that indigenous peoples are not, that these are, you're dealing with political orders and that requires a kind of overhaul of your sensibility. Oh, there are political orders here? not like little DNA containers, you know, vessels of DNA yeah. Or, yeah. or vessels of difference that can then tell me who they are. Um, and then there's like the matter of truth, which is where I think this book really helps us to think, I, I think I can see political theorists working with it. Like where, there is a kind of a, a problem for all of us in that, you know, we wanna think, I don't know where I'm going with this actually. Cause it's like, it's, it's, I, I see this also, you know, we want to give everybody their 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 due. You know, and say, oh, you know, nobody would knowingly do this, or you know, or truth yeah. is is yeah. shifting and whatnot. And at the same time, you know, I think for some folks who are who have been dealing with this for years and years and years and years, there's a sense that you know, yeah, no, actually, there is a truth and it's knowable. <laughs> and like, and yeah, like, yeah. Institutions have to sign on to that also. So yeah, so, I, I I don't think there's a lot of of, I don't think our institutions sort of understand and or have built capacity for understanding. So I cannot tell you how many conversations I have, and I've been complaining about this since grad school, uh, the frustration of having to educate educators on the basic difference between um, a racial or minority group and indigenous people. I mean, it, it's just, you know, it's ongoing. And, and it's like you said, part of it is easy and, and precision. And part of it is, you know, the, the institution benefits in so many PR kind of ways, right? To sort of claim admission and hiring and, and promotion of, of native scholars. And, and they don't want to get into the racism of you know, telling people that they're not who they claim maybe they are. Um, and so I, I, I guess I wonder, you know, what in that um, is possible for, for an acknowledgement that, you know, indigenous groups have systems of relationality that um, account for and care about those who have been uh, stolen and adopted out, those who are of mixed descent, um, uh, those who cannot enroll for any number of reasons. Um, you know, many tribes have gone to great lengths to change their membership criteria and move away from the IRA government model around membership so that they're accounting for the, the realities of people marrying in and marrying out, right? Like all of those politics. Um, uh, and, 
And so I, I guess I don't know if it's possible to, for that to have a relationship to institutions that wanna, wanna pit indigenous peoples into one group that they can administer when indigenous groups are so many, right? There's hundreds of them in the US and Canada. Um, yeah, I, I, and, and one thing I will say is that, you know, somebody like Elizabeth Warren or Joseph Boyden or the many others who have been kind of outed uh, are like that outing happened after years, in some cases, decades of those communities attempting to hold those individuals accountable and someone finally just losing their mind, <laughs> right? And going public with it. Um, and so it's, it's uh, you know, it's a really difficult, difficult question. Uh, it makes me nervous when Canada says that it's gonna pass some bill and create a registry and, you know, I, I get very nervous about lists and centralization and what's going to get normalized with that. So, yeah, it's it's fraught. It's very, very fraught. I might just jump in too and note that um, when we have like fraudulent claims, they are usually not people claiming Indigenous relation. Like it is a, a very individual claim often. Um, they don't want all of the relations because it gets messy and then people are there holding you accountable. And I think part of um, what this book does really well is just shows us the dangers of a rights-based framework and how those work right. both the sort of identity um, arena and on, on the territories where there's land, you know, land defense issues at, at play because it is, it is the same movement from the state they want to they want to know if you can check the box to say if you're wet sew it in and then if you're both wet sew it in and doing the right cultural activities then you're allowed to be there right um, but the what makes it allowable for you to be there is that you've sought the permission of the house group who is responsible for that territory which is not has nothing to do with checking a, a racial box um, and that kind of decision making is is the whole issue at play. And it is, I mean, the institution is there as well. Like the the feast structure, the potlatch, and what's so it in territories is the governance structure. Is that's the place where decisions are made. Um, and it's the decision that actually puts people into the category of being a, a, a terrorist. There, you know, the police and the uh, the industry are, are happy to meet with the chiefs and recognize that they are Wet'suwet'en and chiefs, but if they say no and stand on the road, um, then they're gonna be subject to the same kinds of force uh, that, that everyone else is. So it's that actual, that's political decision-making that puts people in that category. They're allowed to be cultural in the right kinds of ways. And the company itself actually thinks that, that it's, po it's possible for Wet'suwet'en pe people to live as Wet'suwet'en people on the territory at the same time as this pipeline goes in um, because they've, categorized indigenous people in this realm of like, you can do your cultural activities and you can do your gathering and hunting. And um, as long as you never say no to right. the, the <laughs> right. and it's fine. Yeah. We, can, yeah. we, can, we can have it all. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Okay, so I'm being cognizant of time. And as my role as moderator, I'm supposed to be paying attention to time. Oh, yeah. and, and FYI, Mark did um, post a clarification in the in the chat oh. and there was another question in the chat but we only have about three minutes left and so i wanted to see oh. if we have to do our raffle we have to do our raffle because the fun isn't over um mark it, it, what was his it, it, does he have another question or a clarification so he he's okay with us moving forward Oh, yes. No, that's that's Colton, my colleague Colton telling us to go over time. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so um, um, yeah, I'm open to whatever people want to do, but I also want to give things away. <laughs> it's up to you all. 
let me just let me uh, uh let's see someone just put in the chat a question for Anne. is there yes, any yes. direct support that camps need now that you can share with everyone i think somewhere in the long feed of, of chats there were some links but perhaps um as we begin to um wrap up we can maybe put in if you can put in a few more uh, links to those yeah so i just put into access.com back in um there's also unistoten.camp if you want to uh sort of get in there the into access.com will have a, a space where you can donate there are people still facing um uh, with that breach of the injunction and there's lots of legal costs because now in order for people to access the territory again they have to find a way to get these conditions dropped which is requiring a lot of like legal effort um and there's still occupations happening on the territory. There's still, you know, people are still pushing uh, against this company, which is which is trying to go through. So there's lots more information there, also in the um, financial side of it, how you can sort of look at what, what, who's financing and insuring and um, in behind the pipeline. So that that's mostly uh, sort of in that that site. Um, so that I would go there first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Okay, is it time for a raffle? It might be time for a raffle. Um, okay, so I have, um, and again, thank you so much, Audra, and, and just, uh, you know, um, conversation starting. Uh, hopefully we'll continue chatting. Um, and all right, I have, I have a few signed book copies to send and a few pieces of swag. So um, I found this really cheesy online uh, uh, raffle thing. Let me get, let me open it up. Okay. And I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. I'm gonna close that ad because I, ads bugged me. Can you all see that okay? I can see yes. it as everyone good. Is everyone good? Okay, so um, I'm gonna draw seven people, right? So, um, um, and are we giving away to people who aren't here? Because I uploaded all the names of people who registered. What do people want? Um, to I think I don't. I don't know how to do this. I know me neither. I don't. I either. know it's super exciting. I feel like someone just put something in the chat that maybe give us some insights. <laughs> oh no, that was just okay. Um, what's that's the first winner. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit the the spin already. But um, okay, so our first winner is I have to figure out how to copy this name. I'm writing them down for you. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now we remove you, so you can't win again. Um, did we decide on whether or not they have to be present? Was their opinion in the chat? Uh, yeah, there wasn't any opinions in the chat, okay. folks. Okay. So, so we'll just, just be inclusive and go for everyone? Yeah. Okay, that's one. Here's two. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. All right, now we remove you. Okay, number three. <laughs> My bestie. Um. Woo -hoo! <laughs> um okay. Uh all right. How many is that? Three? Three, okay. Number four. It, two people from you, Vic. All right. 
Was that five? Okay. Oh. I don't know who that is. Don't remove them yet. I have to write their names down. Okay. Okay, ready. Was that number six? So we're at the last one. Oh, we're at five. So we're at six now. Okay. Remove. Nelly Jeffy at Berkeley. You ready? That's is this the last one? Is this number six? I can't remember. This is the last one. Final oh, no. spin of the wheel. Last one. Ah. Okay. All right. Okay. Oops. All right. So if there are any final quick questions or comments that anybody would like to make, we're willing to do that before we end. Oh, best place to order the book. If we are in Canada, my get, yeah. Oh, if you're in, um, let me see. I have a link. Um, you can probably get it through through other independent um, venues, but here's the the UC Press page in the chat room. No final comments, questions. A lot of amazing thank yous, thank yous, thank yous. Oh, you are good. awesome. Um, can't wait to teach the book. Can't wait to read the book. Oh, Such good. an uplift to hear the brilliance of all y'all. <laughs> Lots of amazing gratitude coming in through the chat. Excellent. Oh, here's a question. What could land back transform into a basis for? And I lost it because it keeps moving. There's so much goodness ah. coming in. Question about land back though. Ah, into a basis of governance to unite indigenous struggles. Uh, so could land, land back transform into a basis for, of governance to unite indigenous struggle? I think, I think so. What does Anne think? Yeah, it's a good start. Let's start there. Yeah. <laughs> And and we mean actually land back. That's not a metaphor. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No more apologies. I'm so tired of people saying I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. It's like I say to my kids, enough sorry. Now just go make the change. That's right. Stop doing whatever it is that you're sorry for doing and do it differently next time. That's right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. And thank you, Audra. Thank you, Joanne, for writing an amazing book. Oh, thank you, everyone, and you for taking time. And so, uh, please don't forget to send me your email or e mailing addresses for prizes. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, everyone. I will email you the list of okay. emails.
Okay. And if you still have them somewhere, then you can even double check and make sure I didn't um, misspell them when I sent them. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I've saved a, 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 I've saved the list of um, participants. So I have that. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you, Hoku. And don't, and, and don't forget to pick the print you want as a thank you. Will do. I'm so excited. I know it's very exciting. Okay. I should stop this recording, right? Yes, we should stop the recording. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know. Oh, right. I think that's Not that I, I know mean. how to do that. Oh, wait. Pause. Stop. Okay.